Hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Red Haired Stokey. So this week we are going to talk about the explosion at Fold. It's better known locally as the Fold Explosion or the Fold Crater. Now I might be pronouncing that wrong, I don't know, I've always said it as Fold, I don't know if it's pronounced Fold or you know how strange things are pronounced but I'm going to stick with Fold, that's how I've always heard it pronounced. So I don't know if you guys have heard about this before but at 11.11am on the 27th of November in 1944 there was an explosion, the biggest non-nuclear explosion in the UK that would forever change the face of the countryside in Staffordshire. And it was actually near a, a small rural village of Hanbury. And Hanbury, even today, is still quite a small rural village. It's mostly farms, and farming fields, that sort of thing. But it was here, there's a gypsum mine. And they chose, the, the RAF during the war chose this gypsum mine as their underground ammunition store during World War II. It basically got bigger and bigger until there was over 40,000 tonnes of ammunition stored in the mine. That is until that fateful day in 1944, when about 4,000 tonnes of munition, including 500 million rounds of rifle ammo, exploded, and it caused catastrophic damage and a, and a 12 acre crater that still remains today. Now, the Ford explosion is relatively well known in the area. It's the biggest non-nuclear explosion in the UK, and I think probably the biggest non-nuclear explosion of the war in general um, in the world. I don't think there was anything else that wasn't nuclear that was bigger than it. And it started because of a gypsum mine because of mining in Staffordshire. So for hundreds of years, gypsum has been mined in South Staffordshire. And the stone has been mined for things like creating alabaster gypsum plaster, which is used in construction. And in the 19th century, gypsum mining became a commercial venture at Fold. And this mine just grew and grew and grew. And it was 1937 that the RAF requisitioned an unused gypsum mine that was next to Peter Ford's plaster works in Fold, and they wanted this to store the ammunition. It was about 90 feet below Stone Pit Hills, so I don't know if anybody's, if you know the area at all. Now, this underground area was chosen because of its rural location and its size, because obviously during the war, it had to be kept a secret. It had to have relatively good transport links. It had to be away from cities because they didn't want it getting bombed. They wanted to be able to hide it. And it was also because of its size, which was enough at the time to store 10,000 tonnes of bombs and ammunition. But it would eventually be expanded up to about 40,000 tonnes. Now, you can ask yourself why they didn't go for the coal mines and things in Stoke and Staffordshire. But the honest truth is, one, they weren't big enough. And two, they weren't secure enough. The plus side with the gypsum mine is that they mine through stone. So the support is the stone. So you didn't have to dig through soft earth and prop it up. It was actually propped up itself. And the mine proved to be a good place to store the munitions because of this. They, as they were mining through, they left natural rock pillars every 20 foot or so to support the roof which was also made of rock. And the RAF then added a concrete roof and two walls, one 10 foot thick and one 50 foot thick to separate the things that exploded from the things that burned, so the incendiaries. And then to transport the munitions, because again, they wanted to keep it relatively hidden, they built a light railway and that was to transport from the inside of the mine to the main railway line at, at Scropton. Now, near to where this store was, there was actually a live gypsum mine owned by Peter Ford Limited. 
and it was decided by experts that there was no risk to this live mine as there was a natural wall of rock about 50 foot thick between them that would act as a, as a good enough blast barrier if there ever was an accident. Now this underground store was run and maintained by the RAF and it was maintained by Maintenance Unit 21, which is better known as 21MU. And if you look at the records of who was working there at the time, the records were not very well kept, but, and it's probably because of the statute of secrecy at the time, but it seems there was around 18 officers, about 470 servicemen and 445 civilians. So this, this was not a small undertaking. We're talking, like I say, 40,000 tonnes of ammunition and near on 1,000 staff just in this one underground mine. And in 1944, they added 195 Italian prisoners of war, which were brought in from a prisoner of war camp at Hilton. Now, the actual explosion itself happened on the morning of the 27th of November 1944. There's been much discussion about what set it off, but the general consensus is that there was an armourer working in the store and he found a damaged exploder on a 450 kilogram bomb that was in a pile of, of similar bombs. Now, he tried to remove the exploder, which was normal. You, you could take these things apart, put them back together. They were for an explosive, relatively safe to work on. They weren't designed to explode until you wanted them to explode. But, unfortunately, he used a brass chisel to remove the exploder. Now, this was completely against the regulations because brass causes sparks and sparks cause explosions. And that is exactly what happened. So the spark set off the bomb and then that sort of created an ongoing issue, which in turn set off nearly 4,000 tonnes of the explosives that were stored in the mine. It wasn't just small bombs and it wasn't just rifle ammunition that, that were stored down there. There was actually two 1,500, uh, there was actually 1,500, sorry, two tonne blockbusters. So each one of these bombs was two tonnes. And there was 1,500 of them down there. And this was what the RAF used to use to destroy towns. So you could drop this in the centre of a town and it would cause a crater. That's how big and destructive these bombs were. And they went off as well. Now, the actual explosion was at 11.11am. 11, 11 and reports from people that survived around the area said that there was two explosions. The first was a loud, sharp crack, which was very quickly followed by an incredible blast. Now, the explosion under the ground created a mushroom cloud above the ground, and it moved, it fired basically a million tons of earth and rock, including the roof of the mine and the 90 foot of rock and earth above it, straight into the air. And the dust, after that rose about 11 miles into the sky. So this was not a small explosion. 11 miles the dust went. I can't even fathom how high that, that must have been. The other thing that it did is it caused huge pieces of gypsum, some weighing over 20 tonnes, firing into the sky. And if you walk around the full crater now, you can actually still see these big chunks of gypsum everywhere because they were too big to move. And they just landed randomly in the middle of fields or by the side of the road. And they're still there to this day. You can see them as you walk around. So the, after the, the actual explosion, the dust fell for over three hours and it covered everything for miles and miles around in a thick layer of dust. And just like when it snows, it made everything eerily quiet. And people said that they could hear sounds from a mile off, that the, the birds weren't making any noise. There wasn't any sound of traffic on the roads, the farm machinery. It was just silent, which 
I presume after something like that would have been eerie. Either that, or they'd all lost their hearing from the explosion. But we'll never know. I mean, to talk about the extent of the damage of this explosion, just and how far it actually went, the, the size of this explosion is unimaginable to us today. And the explosion was heard as far as London. And a, a plane flying 100 miles away saw the flash. And it even the blast even registered on a seismograph in Switzerland. So it registered as an earthquake would. And children at the local school had to hide under the desks. And the local pub, the Cock Inn, was nearly a mile away, was severely damaged and had to be completely rebuilt, as did the village hall. In fact, the Cock Inn still stands today, and it's actually a really nice place. They, they do good food, and you can park on the Cock Inn, have a walk around the crater, and then head back for some lunch. That That is a nice walk I could recommend. But yeah, five miles away in Burton-upon-Trent, there was 150 houses damaged, and two church spires actually cracked because of the blast. One had to be completely dismantled, um, and the other one was repaired. And then in Tutbury, the chimney pots and roofs were broken. So this was not just destructive to the immediate area, there was like a shockwave sent around as well. Now, directly above where the explosion was, so pre pretty much in the middle of the crater that's there today, there was a farm called Upper, Ca Upper Castle Hayes Farm. Now, that completely disappeared. There was absolutely no trace of that farm, no trace of any of the people that were working there. It just was completely obliterated. And there was another farm a quarter of a mile away called Hanbury Fields Farm. And that was completely buried in fallen earth and rock. And again, completely destroyed. And the whole area was strewn with the dead bottles, dead bodies of cattle, sheep, fish. And there was even a, a dam nearby. There was a 30 foot dam and a reservoir. And it was so damaged by the shockwave, by the blast, that it caused a wave of water over 15 foot high. And it was full of earth, trees and rocks. And unfortunately, it was this that hit Ford's plasterwork factory. So even though the blast underground did protect the workers that were underground at the time, the wave of water from, from the reservoir destroyed the buildings and completely buried all of the workers. Now, you can imagine with something this big, and you would you would think there would be no way of rescuing people. You'd think, wow, that sort of explosion, anyone that was in the mine is a goner. But this is World War II in England, and people didn't give up that easily. So as the news of the explosion spread, rescue teams came in from all over the country. But the rescue was very slow due to a lack of lamps, and because there was a large amount of carbon monoxide in the mine, so they had to install fans to ventilate the mine before anybody could even go in and search. And then add to that the fact that there were still thousands of tons of bombs that hadn't exploded. It was an, a ridiculously dangerous undertaking. I mean, these guys knew nothing. They didn't know. I mean, one of the things that you've got to remember in the war is that nobody spoke to anybody. Everything was a secret. So I don't think there was anybody there really that knew how much ordinance was under there or even how many people were under there because you couldn't just whip it up on a computer and have a look. You couldn't even ask someone that worked there because they weren't allowed to tell you. They'd signed the statute of secrecy. And this caused a lot of problems with rescue operations throughout the war. And it did the same with this. But nevertheless, they did persevere. And even Americans who were in a, a, a service hospital at Sudbury came to rescue people from the Peter Ford plaster works. And then there was a there's a prison, Sudbury Open Prison, nearby. And they even got the prisoners out of the open prison at the time to come and clear the debris from the fields. But because of all this, and because it was such a horrific explosion, the progress was very, very slow. 
and some bodies were found weeks later and some were never recovered at all and nor was many tons of ammunition because it was just too dangerous to search deep within the mine. I mean, not only had it exploded and, you know, the roof had caved in, but it was still full of the unexploded ordnance. And even two years later, um, a guy was farming on his farm and he hit something made of metal and it turned out to be a tractor and the body of the bloke that was operating it when the explosion occurred. But because they didn't keep very good records and because the farms had been destroyed, they never knew who was working there. They never knew who they were looking for or even where to look. So they, there was a couple of incidents like this. But there was survivors. Um, one really interesting story is a lady called Mary Cooper. And she was looking after the elderly mother of a farmer when the explosion happened. So she quickly pulled her under the table and somehow, I don't know how, but they both survived. The farmer and his wife actually survived because they were away at market. But everybody else on this farm died. It was just Mary Cooper and the old lady. Unfortunately, Mary's husband, Joseph Cooper, died in the blast because he was driving a train in the mine at the time of the explosion. But because his wife Mary had survived and because back then everybody did their bit, Mary actually volunteered to lay the bodies out and her husband was actually among them, which must have been awful. And the coroner at the time, who was a guy called John Alden, he said, and this is a direct quote for him, this woman of her own free will has cleaned and scrubbed a very gruesome temporary mortuary every day for 72 days. The work has been indescribable. She has helped with the undressing and also with the washing of clothes removed from the victims. One of the first victims she had to deal with was her own husband. In most cases, that would have been sufficient for a middle-aged woman to undertake without volunteering to continue the work with all the remainder. She survived the wreck of a farm at which she was looking after an old lady. And it is probably due to her action that the old lady's life was saved. I mean, that's a pretty badass woman, isn't it? Let's be honest. And another interesting person from the explosion is a guy called Lionel Poynton. He was RAF Corporal Lionel Poynton. And he was actually caught in the blast in the mine. And he crawled for an hour in complete darkness. He didn't have a torch, everything was completely sealed. And he was feeling the, tra the railway tracks and collecting survivors that he could hear or feel along the way and getting them to follow him along the railway tracks until they got to safety. And there was another guy called Arthur Harris who worked at RF Ford. And before he died, his knowledge of the site allowed him to save many lives. He returned to the crater to continue rescuing when there was another smaller explosion that killed him. But the aftermath of this blast is still there to see now because the blast actually caused a crater that covers over 12 acres. 12 acres. I can't even fathom how big that is until you, until you stand and look across this crater. Only then can you get a, an idea of the magnitude of this. It's 12 acres across and 120 foot deep. And at the bottom of the crater is what's left of the support pillars from the mine. Now, again, it's, it's worth remembering that this was during wartime. And the story soon hit the national headlines as one of the worst wartime disasters at home. And the Daily Mail, as usual, exaggerated and said that only over 200 people had died. But the government criticised the newspaper saying it was damaging public morale. There's nothing new there. The actual official report after the investigation stated that there was 90 people killed, missing or injured, including 26 in the mine, a mix of RAF personnel civilian workers and Italian prisoner of wars and there was 37 killed or missing at Peter Ford and Sons gypsum mine and plaster mill and the surrounding countryside and 12 were also injured 
There was also approximately seven farm workers killed at Upper Castle Hayes Farm, and one person was killed during the search and rescue. And there was also many, many animals. I mean, we talk about, you know, the cows and the sheep from the farms, but there was horses on the farms, there was all the local wildlife. I mean, 12 acres. How many, you know, rabbits and birds and, you know, general things are we talking about? That That's, that's an insane amount of creatures that have been killed. Now, again, because it was World War II and because we were at war, the Germans tried to claim that it was sabotage. And, you know, conspiracies went around that it was the IRA or Italians, a bomb from an enemy plane, or even a new German V2 flying bomb. And even though there was an inquiry during wartime, the results were only made public about 30 years later. And in 1974, they did declare that the explosion was an accident. The clean-up afterwards was limited. So I said to each other, the guys came from Sudbury Prison to try and clean up some of the clutter and the rubble from the fields. And they did manage to remove thousands of tons of unexploded bombs in the cleanup. But it is estimated that there's over 3,000 tons of unexploded ordnance in the collapsed mine that was unreachable. Um, I mean, I mean, there is a Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act request to confirm that if, if you want to go and have a look. I'm not scaremongering. There is genuinely over 3,000 tonnes of unexploded bombs underneath this village. And there is nothing they can do about it. You can't go down and try and, uh, try and find them because if you go down and you're moving the stones and you knock one and it detonates, that's 3,000 tonnes. It's nearly the same explosion again. Add to that the fact that they've been down there since 1944, they will be a lot, probably a lot more powerful and a lot more, what's the word, unstable. So you couldn't just go down there and carry them out now anyway, because they've been down there for that long. So I think the RAF used the mine, the outer bit of the mine, until the 60s, and then it was all sealed up. And there was a relief fund organised by the local people to pay the families of the victims and survivors. That lasted until about 1959. And there was a, a shallow instrument search in the 60s and a visual search in the 70s. But it's like I said before, the ordinance was buried so deep in the mines that it collapsed. that It was just too dangerous. So... They just, they still stored munitions there, weirdly, until the 60s. Um, and then it was used for a little bit by the Americans to store ammo that they used to store in France. I'm not sure why. Again, we can't find much information on it. But, but yeah, I mean, you can head out and have a look at this crater. It's called the Fold Crater. It's, it, it's near a village called Hambry. It's still there. It's completely visible. And the crater itself was fenced off in 1979. You can't, like, climb down into the crater. And there are walks and, and public footpaths around it. And it is the area is a haven for wildlife. It's almost like a, a, a little park now. There's over 150 species of trees. And as you're walking along the path and through the nearby fields, you'll see large pieces of gypsum, which are still in the exact place that they fell when the mine exploded. The worrying thing is, though, is that the area is just, it's not safe. It's just not safe. And as the bombs keep deteriorating with age, the risk that they pose rises. Every year, the risk gets higher. And Fold is one of the few sites in the UK where unexploded ordnance from World War II still poses an ongoing threat. It poses so much of a threat that the Ministry of Defence said that the edge of the crater and the fence are inspected annually by 5131 Squadron, which is the bomb disposal. And then the results of that report are sent to the Explosive Safety Representative and the Health and Safety Representative at RAF Cosford. They have to inspect this 
every year just to make sure, one, that no one's going down into the crater, which they do, but I'll come on to that in a minute, and two, that the whole thing's not going to go up again, but they cannot guarantee that. There is no guarantee that this might not ever happen again. And I don't know about you, but it probably put me off living there. <laughs> I don't think it's affected the house prices then. But uh, there's a, as you walk around the walk, though, there is a memorial stone and this stone was created using a stone that was donated by the Italian government, which was flown to the UK from Italy on an RAF plane. And it was unveiled in 1990. And then there was another memorial that was created for the 70th anniversary of the disaster in 2014. You can see them as you walk around the crater. And like I say, it's a beautiful place for a walk. It's a concerning place for a walk. But nothing's happened since 1944. And I feel like if there was a real risk, the quarantine area would be a lot bigger. Um, I think the thing that worries me more than anything is anyone that knows me knows that I like urban exploring. I like exploring places. I like to go into abandoned buildings. I like to go and photograph, you know, abandoned factories, tunnels, that sort of thing. If you look at my blog, The Red Ed Stokey, I love tunnels. I love hidden things. But this is one I don't think I'd play with. Um, if you go online and you search for Fold Crater Urbex, you just type that in, many, many people have gone down and you can still get in. They've all photographed it. There's videos on YouTube. I, I'm not going to go down. I, I'll just go off other people's photos. Thank you very much. But it does give you a real feel of what it must have been like down there. A lot of the walls are still intact. Obviously, the bit where the bombs are is, is caved in, so you can't get down there. But you can see the beginning of the cave in. And you can see, you know, the light gauge railway. The carts are still down there. All of the signs are still on the wall. Um, the walls, the doors, the windows, everything that they put in, the RAF is all still down there. Um, and it's just a real strange, interesting place. I think as a mine, it was quite a beautiful mine, if mines can be beautiful, the way that it was carved through the stone, the way that they left the pillars. It's a very photogenic place. Um, but would I want to go down there knowing, <laughs> knowing that there was 3,000 tons of bombs next to me that, that were exploded? Probably not. Probably not. But... A lot of newspapers have featured these pictures and I'm talking about it now with you guys. People are watching, listening, going to read about it. And that's probably going to encourage more people to go down, unfortunately. I can't stop them. I do enjoy looking at the pictures. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that someone's been in because now we know what it looks like in there. And now we know what it must have been like to work down there. But it's not for me, thank you very much. <laughs> I think I'll stay up above. But yeah, so I think I'll leave it there this week. So if you head over to my blog, which is the Red Haired Stokey, you can have a look at the article that I wrote on this. If you just go on, the article is called There Are World War II Bombs Hidden Underneath Staffordshire. But if you just search for Fold or something like that, it'll come up. And you can have a look for more fold urbex pictures online that's an interesting one so yeah if you want to support me you can subscribe head over to my blog and sign up for the for the newsletter there's plenty of ways you can support me head over and like me on facebook and i'll keep you up to date but this is going to be the last show for a few weeks i'm going to take a little break and concentrate on getting some new blog articles up on the website so yeah i'll leave it there but thank you very very much for joining me and we'll see you again in a few weeks' time. So, yeah, thank you.